Today I'd like to present to you a hypothesis. And this hypothesis is something I've been thinking about for a while with programming language design. And that is that the high or low level nature of a language is in fact a plane similar to a horseshoe. Or you could probably model it as a quadratic or something like that. But essentially, uh, there's a certain point at which you have such diminishing returns that attempting to make a language any higher level in fact makes it lower level and unusable to humans. So in order for this thesis to work, or this conjecture I suppose, we should first make some assumptions. So first of all I'm going to assume that by high level we're introducing, by making a language more high level, we're introducing more abstraction. And uh, a perfect example of this first of all is the difference between two of my favorite languages uh, C and Go. So C gives you full control over heap allocations and D allocations at the expense of the fact that if you don't call free at least once for each corresponding malloc of non-zero size then you will have a memory leak especially when done in a loop uh, or when done kind of uh, consecutively without freeing. And uh, so if this is done repeatedly, like in the main game loop of a game, then you have a memory bomb and are going to either crash your system or crash your program. But in Go, however, we have a garbage collector. And the garbage collector has many, many complex details under the hood, but uh, effectively all it means is that the programming language itself is going to call malloc and free for you under the hood and so the heap will be traversed and any unused blocks or blocks that are no longer being used will be automatically freed for you by the language and so this is very good for programmer productivity because it no it means that memory leaks are incredibly difficult to come by uh, I have yet to come across any Go program as a matter of fact that actually has any memory leak bugs in it at all and so what's happened here is we've started out here at low level and we've shifted up a little bit and we've shifted up around here. I wouldn't call Go massively high level, but I'd probably put it probably around here, I don't know. And then if you go up slightly further, you get uh, languages like Python, where the details of memory in its entirety are completely abstracted away from you. There's no way to even control allocation and deallocation, uh, and variables are dynamically typed. The language will infer things for you. And uh, typing is another good example of where this comes in, but I'm going to talk about that later when I talk about the examples of the recessions on this other side here. And so you start to go further and further, but as you start to go further and further, there's a point at which this abstraction starts to make it so that um, the internal details of the machine are just as difficult to understand. Because if we think about what's the purpose of a high-level programming language, or a programming language that is not assembly language, essentially, what do we think that the purpose of that is? Well, the purpose of it is so that you don't have to memorize and know the internals of the machine and its instruction set and all of that uh, detailed, complicated nonsense to get a simple program written. I don't have to know about the semantics of the multiply single scalar precision instruction in order to write a simple pi calculator or approximator in Go. I don't need to know the internals of how a stack and a stack frame and how you know heap blocks work in order to write a simple C program because the C runtime will handle it for me. And yet at a certain point the details of what decisions have been made for you on your behalf by the machine and by its runtime start to become the internal details of the machine that they're trying to abstract away. And there is no better example of this than JavaScript. If we open an editor, uh, JavaScript, and we write a function, so I think you just write function in, in uh, JavaScript, and if I write function func and then uh, open and close. And then, if we create two constants, const a equals a, b, c, d, const b equals 27, okay? What happens if we return a plus b from this function? Because I can actually guarantee to you this is valid JavaScript. This is perfectly valid. This will actually run under Node, and it will run in your browser. So what's going to happen? Well, I can tell you, in any other high-level programming language that's not very, very weakly typed like JavaScript is, this will be an error. 
There is no way for this to actually work. This is nonsensical to most compilers. But in JavaScript instead, an arbitrary decision as to what this means was made on the behalf of the programmer by the people who designed the system. And so, navigating any large JavaScript, pure JavaScript project, has become almost as tedious and difficult as navigating any large assembly language or C project because the internal details of the system that's running this program need to be known. Instead of having to learn a large instruction set for a CPU, instead you have to know a large effectively instruction set of what the compiler is going to do for some arbitrary thing. And so programming languages which don't take the step of making these arbitrary decisions for you fall at this line here, and I call this the event horizon of accessibility, or the accessibility horizon, where you start to get diminishing returns as to how high level you've made things. And so effectively, the plane of all of the possible programming languages exists on a Mobius strip, where we start out here at assembly language, and we try to abstract away and abstract away and abstract away until we get back to the exact same place, but looking very different. So, this is what I'm going to call the horseshoe hypothesis of programming language design. If you abstract away too many details, you get back in the exact same place that you did when you were attempting to uh, make it so you didn't have to know internal details, because all that you've done is replace one set of internal details you need to know with another set of internal details you need to know. So here's another interesting thing that we could try. What if we do const b equals nil, uh, or is null? Uh, and set this to null, and then const c equals, and then let's set it to an object where, a, uh, I don't know, d equals a, b, c, d. I think this is valid JavaScript. Uh, I wouldn't bet on it though. What happens if we do, uh, add, what happens if we do c dot f equals b? Currently there is no field called f on c. So what does this do? Well, to the untrained eye, it might seem like it should obviously be an error. Surely this should be an error. Well, no. In fact, this will result in the creation of a field called f, because this is, in fact, just a JSON object. And uh, JavaScript will, complete, will run this code perfectly well. So I'd like to just contrast this for a moment. If we go into... Uh, and look at mfact.s. This is uh, a algorithm for calculating a factorial in x86 assembly. So I'm going to remove every single comment from here uh, and make this look like it would do from the perspective of some kind of uh, assembler. This is, this is analogous to what an assembler would generate from a C program. So this, for me, is just as difficult to read as this, or what we had before when we were, uh, when we had this, because you have to know arbitrary details of the machine in order to write this code correctly. Details of the machine that you had to recall continuously throughout writing the program. And so rather than having to memorize lots of registers when you're writing JavaScript, instead you need to memorize every single possible, uh, like usage of the append operator or the plus operator. I don't actually know what this will do. It will either serialize this, because think about all the different things it could do. It could serialize b as a string and append it to a. It could append an ASCII character of value 27. It could convert a, b, c, d incorrectly to a number which will result in a zero if we're doing things the c way. And so the result of this would be 27. It could, uh, it could simply convert this to a raw string. It could convert this to a raw string and append it to the raw string here. So there are so many different things that this could do that it's not clear. And so this arbitrary decision that was made, this is the key point that I want to get at. All that we've done in writing a program like this is simply replace knowing arbitrary details about the implementation of your processor with knowing r details that were chosen by a committee about a programming language. And that's really what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get at the fact that abstracting away too much results in a worse experience than actually abstracting away fewer details because you have simply replaced one set of details that need to be memorized with another set of details that need to be memorized. And uh, 
if we need final kind of uh, circumstantial proof of uh, my horseshoe hypothesis of programming language design, uh, what happens with a low-level programming language generally? What happens to make the usage of low-level programming more useful? Well, generally speaking, we develop higher level languages that sit on top of these languages. What has happened with JavaScript? Well, we now have about 7 billion frameworks that sit on top of its horrible design, uh, such as, for instance, TypeScript, which, believe it or not, you know, I made out in the Soy Dev video that I really, really hate JavaScript. Don't get me wrong, I do. But I'm not against the usage of JavaScript in general if it is the, if it's necessary. Like, uh, I, I think, for instance, sites like YouTube that are just serving you a static video can perfectly well deal without JavaScript for most of it. Uh, and it's a very heavy website for what it needs to do. And I think that most JavaScript frameworks are unnecessary. However, if you have to write JavaScript, I think you should do it in TypeScript. Because TypeScript is the higher level language that sits over the effectively low level language of JavaScript. Because JavaScript sits so far over in this direction, maybe about here or something, uh, it sits so far over in this direction that it's become a low level language again. And it's just as difficult to write correct code in JavaScript as it is to write correct code in like C88 or whatever it is, C89, where you have to manually allocate stack variables at the top of the frame and stuff like that. It's difficult. Another good example of this that I didn't load up even though I intended to uh, there should be a yes, here we are. So this was a game that I had to write uh, as part of uh, my GCSE computer science and this is written in small basic which is a very very high level programming language probably like over here slightly worse than JavaScript in fact uh, that's designed for teaching children how to program but as you can see here I actually had to invent a method of having a not operator because small basic has no not operator and because this decision was made that there should be no not operator and because the language is so high level that you have to do this stuff, I had to invent my own. The language is so high level, it became low level. Not only that as well, but the language has no functions in it at all. So, in order to factor out repeated code in my program, I had to manually use goto statements and the hacky system involving manually placing labels in an array here for how difficulty should be displayed, for instance. And down here there's an array that I called the jump descriptors that tell the program where it should jump back to after calling a subroutine that I used with gosu statements. You can see an example of this here. So the language is so high level that it's curved back around and become low level again. And so that's my horseshoe that's my horseshoe thesis of computer language design in a few minutes. Um, and effectively, the moral of the story is, you do not go past the accessibility event horizon. You don't go past the horizon of inaccessibility. Uh, so this should be a lesson to budding programmers and program programming language designers, that when you're writing a language, uh, you should try to make it like Go. I go on about Go a lot, but it's mainly because I think that Go is a perfect example of how you avoid implicit behavior. If I set i equal to 10, this has been initialized as an integer, and it's very simple to know the rule for this. It's just it will infer a sensible type for you, and that sensible type is just the base type of what it is. Now, it doesn't do this perfectly. Like, if I do uh, uh, if I do x colon equals 50.4, is this an int 32 or an int 64? Well, go pls will actually tell me if I'm in a project. If I go into a project and do, I don't know, x colon equals 50.7, um, then hover over X, it's going to tell me that it's initialized as a float 64, but that wasn't uh, necessarily known straight away from uh, just looking at the code. And so you have to just know these details of how the Go compiler is going to handle your code.
But generally, this is an issue that you don't run into until you explicitly need to pass this to a function. And Go also will completely refrain from doing any unsafe numeric conversions for you, unlike C. And this is a place where C falls down. Every language has its failings like this. And these are two Go's, uh, two of Go and uh, C's. So that's that's a quick summary of my horseshoe thesis of language design, also known as the... Uh, I don't know, like, Bonak Tarski's programming language theorem, I don't know. <laughs> you could call it anything related to, like, infinitely recurring patterns. Um, and, uh, yeah, I hope that this is a little bit of wisdom for anybody who's been uh, considering designing any kind of programming language. Which, uh, come to think of it, is probably unlikely, but it's it's very possible, very possible.